Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for Circa for inviting us. And um, I would like to turn over right away um, the mic to my eldest one, Bobby Morris. So good afternoon, Po. I am Bobby Morris. I am 15 years old, and I am also a proud Batam Philippine farmer. So I'm going to tell you the story about uh, Mocha Family Farm before development. Uh, Noong 2006 po, my teacher nanay and my tita Mimi po bought, this, bought our farm as a day destination para sa pamilya po namin. Then in 2009, uh, we went to the farm more often now. So it became a weekend place na po sa pamilya namin. Then, yung tatay ko, he got a job opportunity in Afghanistan as a horticulture. So, horticulturist. So, then we started moving into our farm and it became our new home. Now. And to the present na po, it became a farm, family farm tourism destination for our farm guests. And we are now also accredited by TESDA. And we are also a extension service provider for ATI, which is Agricultural Training Institute of the Department of Agriculture. So the rabbit rabbit tree was Mocha Mocha Family Farms first project. My teacher not thought it would be innovative uh, to show rabbit meat to the local culinary community. So my teacher Nami and Tate were very active in the Farm to Chefs program. So then we were able to establish a good connection with the local culinary community in the Philippines. So like any farm in a Calabarzon area, we were affected by Typhoon Glenda. So we were back in Las Vegas by that time. And we were reviewing the photos and we were devastated. Sabi ko ng teacher namin ko na uh, sa akin na anak, should we just sell the farm? Kaso, ang sinabi ko naman ko sa akin ay uh, no na di ba sabi mo uh, we bought this farm to create good memories. If we sell it, paano kami mag, ano, gagawa pa rin ng good memories? So, my teacher namin went back to the very core uh, values of her family. And she thought that um, what is what do we value in life? Um, what do we value in life importantly? So uh, my teacher Nana, with the guidance of my teacher Tatai, uh, we developed the five F's and one E model: family, farm, food, fun, faith, and education. So yes, we are proud to say that we are a small-scale family farm located in the rural town of Padre Garcia. So our family is very active in the promotion of family farming and advocates of the sustainable farm tourism. I would now like to call on my baby brother, Robbie, to talk to you on our sustainable family farm tourism activities. participation in farm activities and or other attraction offering. 
but it is not complete if it does not supplement, provide supplemental income to the farmer slash farm operator. Agritourism can be categorized into two groups, family farm agritourism and commercial farm agritourism. But what's the difference? Family farm and commercial farm agritourism and, and commercial agri-farms go into farm tourism for different reasons. Makaiba po sila. Larger farm enterprises have far more in common with commercial hospitality, like hotels and resorts. For smaller family farm operations, it is more like a lifestyle entrepreneurship and private hospitality. The sharing of rural experience with outsiders is one key reason why farmers engage in tourism. So when you visit our small family farm, you can spend the day enjoying us in our day-to-day -day family farm activities. Bread making, seed propagations, harvesting, food preservation such as picking, drying, fermenting, etc. Or simply enjoy a relaxing day with our family. Or you can have a manicure or pedicure, but talk to my mom about that, not me. I don't know anything about that. But it will also provide us some supplemental income for our community. This is an example of our bread making activity in the farm. The dough here is mixed with glutenatea, an edible blue flower that can be that is grown on our farm. And now I would like to call on my kuya again. So uh, my nana realized that it's difficult to farm alone. She is passionate that every family farmer should have a networking community. Um, we did our first meetup at Terra Verde Farm in Cavite. From the first, then came second, third, fourth, fifth, and last March on the sixth meetup event, which is back to back with the first small and family farm conference that was held here Circa. Then two weeks ago on the seventh meetup, they already formed an ad hoc committee to work on the organization of the Pampinian Filipino farmers. Uh, my family believes that the answer to the sustainable future is the return to family farming. Means I'm hindi ko may nindian ng teacher namin ko. Kami na nga lang ni Kuya ang pamilya namin, masakit na ulo niya. Gusto niya ko nang mas masakit na ulo by embracing bigger family for your community. Sometimes, ang hirap niya ang pilihan, so we really don't have a choice but to join her. As you all know, if you can't beat her, might as well join her. Last year, she went to Virginia, USA to present to present the state of small farms in the Philippines in the 7th National Small Farm Conference. She went on her own and, of course, she got inspiration on that trip to start the first National Small Farm Farmers Conference. So now I'm sure she is dying to get this microphone away from me so she can talk about small scale farm farming. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, it, my, my, uh, probably you've heard my two boys refer to me as teacher nana. I'm a homeschool mom, so I homeschooled them. I've been homeschooling them for the last seven years. So Ravi and Bobby have seen uh, all our activities in the farm. So they, as they said, they are a member of Latin Filipino farmers. Um, this, these are groups of kids then anak na mga family farmers that we network with and as I've always also told as Bobby have also told you earlier um, we have a group of network uh, we network a lot with the family farmers I always believe that uh, for a small scale family farmers it's always important for us to network with the other family farms sometimes especially like when you have uh, cases like as a family farm you really cannot control nature so sometimes you are devastated, you get devastated by that food, and there are always times that you wanted to give up. And when you have other friends and you see them, they just pick up the pieces as if it's just a natural thing. Oh, but today, 
tomorrow, they wake up in the morning, all happy and smiling again, and then they just continue and go on with their life as if nothing happens. So when I decided that I'm going to become a family farmer, that we are going to become a family farmer, it was one of those things that I realized. So I know that we are a resource speaker here, but I really, uh, the homeschool mom in me always love to ask questions. So my question is, are you a 21st century Filipino farmer? <laughs> anyway, so um, so what is a 21st century farmer? I always said a 21st century farmer should be a multifunctional farmer. Um, my topic here is that small family farms and build multifunctional roles in inclusive and sustainable agriculture and rural development. So let me just bullet the points that I'm going to say. As Robbie had warned you earlier, I can go on and on and on. So uh, I'm going to talk about what is a small farm or what is a small family farm. What does it take to be a multifunctional farmer? How can small family farm contribute in inclusive and sustainable agriculture? How can small family farm contribute in rural development? Now let me define small farm according to our Republic Act 7607, Magna Carta of Small Farmers. Small farmers refer to natural person dependent on small scale subsistence farming as their primary source of income and whose sale, barter, or exchange of agricultural product do not exceed a gross value of 180 thousand pesos per annum, but this is based on the 1992 constant prices because this is when the RA was promulgated. So DA and DA are supposed to like constantly update this uh, price, uh, this, this price. A uh, small agricultural producer refers to any self-employed individual who by himself or with his family provide the primary labor. Uh, labor requirement of the business enterprise or one who earns at least 50% um, of his gross income from the payment or proceeds of income of the labor he provides. But we have a different definition of what a small farm is. Um, our group of small-scale family farmers in our community and our network like this definition better. And this is a definition provided by Professor Jen Eichert of Small Farms, the author of the book, Small Farms Are Real Farms. The farmer who thinks he or she would be successful if they just had more land and more capital is a large farmer by heart, no matter how small the farm. The farmer who is always trying to figure out how he or she might be able to make a better living on less land and less capital is a small farmer at heart, no matter how large the farm is. So, a true family farm represents a way of life rather than just a means of making an economic living. I always say, like, when, um, when we started doing this, I always ask this question, how can we meet the needs of the present without diminishing opportunities for the future? And we realize, soon we realize that when we talk about sustainability, this is our sustainability balance or the scale. It's so hard to, like, run a family farm when you're not earning. So there's always have to be the economic viability in a family farm. But it will not, it's not, it should not be focused on that alone. It should also be, there should always be the balance between ecological integrity and social equity. Sustainability is inherently multifunctional. So I will always use this term multi, multifunctional. You have to be a multifunctional farmer. So in that it has three key dimensions. Again, and I will always repeat this, I cannot, ecological integrity, social equity, but there should always be an economic viability. Professor John Eichardt said that only farmers that manage multifunctionally are capable of farming sustainably and thus deserving of the historical steam of the term called family farming. So, I asked you this question earlier, what is a multifunctional farmer? I guess I have to start, uh, before I answer that, let me ask also a question. Why do you think we farm? Can anybody give me an answer? Why do, why do farmers farm? For food, right? And I don't think anybody disagrees with that question, uh, with that answer, right? We farm for food. But then, the really right 
right approach for farming, should not just be focused on food security. I think farming is not just about food security. It has been the logical justification of our farm policies in the past. With growing ecological and social equity concern, a more encompassing farm approach or policy for the future should really be agricultural sustainability. So the concept of agricultural multifunctionality is introduced in order to meet the fact that in the true sense of agriculture, it must meet this three function. And I've said it again, and I will say it over and over again. An agricultural multifunctional family farmer should always consider the economic viability and should not stop there, consider ecological integrity and social equity. And that's the very basis of um, be becoming a multifunctional farmer. Yes, food security is there. We always have to consider that as a farmer, that's our primary goal, but we should not stop there. There's three other things that we have to consider. Now, this function, when we say, so why? Why do we have to consider those things? Because this functions, especially if you are a 21st century farmer, you always have to consider as well, other than the food security, you have to think of the environment, employment, human resources, food safety, food quality, welfare, biological diversity, cultural preservation, economic sustainability. I remember uh, one of our mentors in our um, Rare Food Society of the Philippines is also he's an emeritus professor here in UNL, uh, UNL, uh, UPLB. He's uh, said to be before, he was a big um, advocate of uh, Philippine native trees. Uh, I think some of you probably know him. He's Dr. Roberto Coronel. He recently passed away. Um, but one of the things he always tells us in our group, he said like, you know, sometimes even though there is no economic value on, of, on that tree or on that plant, it is a good idea for you to plant it for sustainability of its genetics. And you wanted to make sure that you know the biological diversity of your plants are still there. And you can always tell, like I, um, I've shown, I think some of the people here, like who have visited some of uh, the people who have visited our farm, I say like this is their susu kalabaw, no? it's a varus varus rufa. Uh, but it's one of those indigenous of the Philippines. We have never, and a lot of people don't know it anymore. People that are older than me, when I tell them about, oh, we have susu kalabaw in the farm, really? Because I've never seen that, but we, when I was a kid, I used, we used to like eat them. If you don't keep them, and if you don't continue to grow them, not necessarily for commercial scale, but at least keep them for biological diversity and genetic uh, preservation of those plants, then it's going to just go away. And it's sad because those are one of the things that are really native to the Philippines, and uh, some of our older Filipinos still remember those things, and it would be nice and fun if our younger generations can still have a taste of those fruits. So, when we explore uh, the evolution of agricultural production system, I think it's very important for us to not just be production focused. The paradigm shift, is, there is a paradigm shift now for family farmers to not just be focusing on production, but you have to focus as well on your multifunctional roles. And this is one of the things that we have discovered in the farm. When we were looking at it, this is a typical agricultural production operation. So if you're a farmer, you basically have your farm inputs, you have your farm tools and equipment, you have your farm supplies like your seeds, seedlings, uh, trellising materials, etc., etc., and of course the labor. And then once you have, because your focus is production, once it's done, you're harvesting it, now you bring it to the market. And that's a typical, very typical, and a lot of farmers still do that. It's a very typical operation. But is this a sustainable way of doing it? For family farmers, this is more like what we follow. A diversified, multifunctional agribusiness operation. Let me just do something here. I think my of something. A 21st century farmer will have this different interaction, different relationship with different sectors, different areas, different sections of the agribusiness operation. So, a um, uh, 21st century farm, oops, something went wrong, let me just, okay. it started it again. <laughs>
little break. <laughs> okay, so like I said, if you're a 21st century farmer, you will probably like buying some farm inputs, but you're also learning how to create your own farm inputs. And you're also selling it to your fellow farmers, selling it to other uh, gardeners. So that's what a 21st century farmer is. So before, you just have your typical palenque for your market. Now, as a 21st century fa farmer, you create other uh, markets, such as the farmers and the producers market. You, have, you open your farm for a new big market. Uh, so there, you create multiple markets for your product, and at the same time, when you create those sub-products, your other family farmers also like create another product, just like what I always say, we train like some uh, lab uh, skilled labor in the farm, and then if another member of our family farm need uh, another skilled labor, then we can also share it with them. So, and in a lot of ways, if you're, you're not alone. A 20th, 21st century farmer should be able to like network, connect with other family farms. And this is part of our cultural relationship. This is part of our social responsibility as well, to connect with other smaller farmers in our community. And this is one of the realizations that we have had in the farm. You really cannot farm alone. You cannot just have like, your own little kingdom of your farm in your family farm and not like know what's going on in your community. So, in a lot of ways, what you do, you start to like work with your community, develop some farmers group to like create some of your uh, produce. Do their, they also do small production for you. And then when you do that, you create more opportunities for them. You create more labor opportunities, uh, you create more market opportunities for them. So again, more labor pool as well for the whole farming community. So this is what we do in our family farm. This is the model now that we follow as uh, a 21st century family farmer. And then there's another opportunity that you can see, the farm tourism operation. The farm tourism operation actually helped us a lot because uh, as a farm tourism provider, uh, there are a few other things that we can focus on. So this is a big and huge market for a lot of family farms and very helpful in the development of the rural communities. Experience, education, and entertainment. So now you bring in a lot of new, uh, you bring in, in into your local economy when you have guests that comes into your farm, what happens is you bring in some money to the local economy and that also provide income to the other um, members of your community. It generates a lot of um, economic activity. So when that happens, a tourism grows, Normally, another aspect should be also attended to, the education. So in our farm, uh, we are also now a PESDA accredited um, family farm that offers farm tourism and other skilled um, classes, uh, skilled training classes. So we know that the, uh, PESDA is focused on skills development, technical vocational. So there are a lot of technical vocational agricultural related programs that are available, it's propagated, but no one is actually doing it. When we started, it was very difficult for us because when uh, in, in Batangas, when we approached our Tesla provincial office and we told them that we wanted to like start um, agricultural techno class, we were told that we don't have any. And I was the first shock because Batangas is a provincial, prov uh, you know, it's an agricultural province, yet we don't have a, a tech box school that offers agri-related uh, trainings. So I said, so how do we start? You know, we really wanted to start uh, that one. They said, well, you have to go to Quezon because Quezon is the only one that has agricultural tech training as far as uh, tech box is concerned. So we went there, we started our relationship with Quezon National Agricultural School started. My husband, uh, who's been a more than 35 years as an horticulturist, he told me that we follow the rules, we follow the policy, and we follow we follow the procedure. For me, sometimes it's easy to get upset, but then he kind of like calms me down and tells me like, hey, let's follow the rule and set a good example. So he went there to be assessed on horticulture uh, national certification level two. And if you really think about it, if you look at the Philippine qualification framework, the level two of national certification is equivalent of for grade 10 and 11. Okay, but we went through because that's the policy of DESTA. So we went through the assessment and that's how we started. And then we started to have our community training. So we have our own staff and our own community. We go to Pinas uh, for training. And then um, after several, with them, they 
finally agreed that they'll be the one to go to the farm and train us because it's so inconvenient. They, they saw how passionate we are. They know that we really wanted to do it. We have shown them that we wanted to really, really do it, even though it's so inconvenient for us. So what they did was they, okay, Miss Gigi, we are going to do a community uh, service on your, uh, on your, uh, uh, in your place, and then we were going, uh, they will be doing the training. Instead of us going there, we're going to go to our farm and do the training. So that's, that's, that's what happened. And then, you know, finally, after two years, we were able to like, get our program registration for agricultural crops, NC1 and NC2. And then because we are also doing tourism, we, have, uh, we were able to like, uh, apply for the program of events management and uh, food and beverage services. So, again, education and then entertainment. So what does it mean? What does, uh, does this mean to us as a family farmer? We realize that there are a lot of government programs that are available. But if there's no legitimate providers like us, we will never be able to like, bring in a scholarship to our community. When we started, it all came from our own pocket. Me and my husband's savings, you know, we have to dig into our personal savings and use them uh, to jumpstart the scholarship in our community. And then later on, uh, you know, we realized that there are actually like, there are actually like a lot of scholarship programs that are available. And um, if you look at the statistics, 30% of agricultural, 30% uh, of our workers in the Philippines are in the agricultural sector. So if you go, if you just base it by the TESTA budget, um, Senator Villar have insisted that because agricultural workers represent 30% of our skilled workers, they need to be, you know, the budget for training should be as much. So what does it mean? That, that means to say like for a family farm like us, if we receive some scholarship program, we can um, give that away to also our community. Then we, uh, we, we have a chance to like train them. And then from there, from that training, we can have a better um, way of giving our guests in our community a better experience and a better way of entertaining them, a, a better customer service. So this is actually very, very important, the farm tourism for the family farms. But again, as Bobby has said, uh, Robin said earlier, it has to be sustainable as well. So I cannot imagine our family farm, uh, when we do our marketing, to like welcome 500 guests in one week. No, I can't do that. That's not sustainable for us. I cannot even imagine how to handle the waste, man the waste management for 500 guests in your farm for a week. So uh, we are a one hectare property. So our holding capacity for Department of Tourism is about 50 to 75 guests uh, a day. But for me, that's already too high. So I really maintain and control our guests in that way that it's really just sustainable for our family farm. Family farms, beginning your experience, are critical to creating rural prosperity in our countries. Farmers must learn to meet the needs of the present without diminishing the needs of the future. And you will hear me say this over and over again. Farmers face unique challenges and requires education and training to ensure their sustainability. Always remembering that sustainability is about ecological integrity, social uh, equity, and economic viability. So these are the questions when I was starting and when I'm normally asked uh, as a resource person, I ask my, especially if they are also like future farmers, I ask them, are you farming for hobby? Are you farming for profit? Those are my first two questions. But then I realized that we were doing this family farm tourism. It is not really the right question. It's really not the question of are you farming for hobby or are you farming for profit? It is a question of are you farming for sustainability and rural development? And we're very proud to say that that is now what we are answering to. We're answering to that question, yes, we are farming. We are farming for sustainability and rural development. And that's what we realize that as a family farmers like us, we have that responsibility in our community. And when we say sustainability, yes, there's economic viability. Because it's never going to be sustainable without that. But again, we have that ecological uh, integrity. And then we also have to like, look at our social um, responsibilities as well. So from farming for fun, farming to profit, now we are really farming for sustainability. And I'm very proud to say that that's what we're doing now. Uh, so just, uh, it's really hard. Uh, again, it's, I, I always say, go local. We have our local responsibility. 
And this, uh, this is one of the things that we have done in our farm. We work with our local women group in our local rural community on livestock production, so uh, small-scale pig farming in the community. So um, tapping the women, um, you know, the resources and the passions of the women in the, in the community. So we do, again, uh, farm tourism activities in our farm. We do have a lot of farm diverse related activities. So we have uh, fun classroom lectures. We have we have developed uh, we, we do farms to chefs activities, and we have developed our own cookbook. We do herb flavored bar treats uh, for those adults. You know, yeah, we also have done something like that. Um, so we have and again the education. We have focus on the education because, like I said, uh, I uh, I've, been I've been a homeschool educator for several years, and my husband is also an educator. So this is something that we have been focusing now on the farm as well. So one of our goal is make sure that learning agri is a fun thing. It's so difficult to introduce farming now and agriculture to the younger people. Siguro wala nang gusto mag-farm sa inyo, masakit sa likod, hindi na naiisip niya, right? Or no, but thank you, I'm so happy. I, I get some young people who will say, no, we are, you know, because really, uh, for us, at first it was a challenge to introduce agri uh, production classes because it's so hard to like make them uh, enjoy it or like warm up to it. But then when we introduce the tourism concept, the farm tourism concept, and then all of the fun things about agriculture, then we start to like get students. And then now, we have a lot of K-12 teachers who are taking our classes and learning agriculture so that they can also teach it to their K-12 students. So, for us, this is now the answer, uh, this is now how we answer to that question. What's the reason why we farm? We farm for sustainability and we farm for rural development. So before we end our presentation, I'd like to like, call my husband who provided us a lot of inspiration in our farm, Bob Morris. Thank you, Gigi. First of all, I wanted to say I'm very, very proud, as you can imagine, of what uh, my wife and my children have made, my family has been able to accomplish in the Philippines with that. Uh, just if I were sitting in your shoes right now, and listening to this, one of the questions I might might uh, think of would be, where did this come from? And uh, my background is I'm an emeritus professor uh, from the University of Nevada and horticulture specialist with cooperative extension. And I have the commercial horticulture segment for all of southern Nevada. And in that programming area, uh, I developed the uh, farm to table events in Nevada and also the local production that's there now originally came from, uh, from my programmatic uh, responsibilities. My, my division was 60% uh, teaching and 30% uh, research and 10% was, uh, was another segment. But in that research segment, uh, I'm still a consulting editor for Hort Science, American Society for Horticultural Science, and I'm still active in that. Recently, uh, and I've done a lot of international work since 1993, I've focused a lot of my work in Central Asia, Northern Africa, Southern Africa, the Middle East, uh, and uh, several other places as well. But uh, I recently read a, a paper, and uh, the author of the paper made a statement that I immediately, I did this back in the States, I copied it and sent it to Gigi because I was floored. Uh, unfortunately, there was no reference to it, so I couldn't follow up to make sure. But the author stated in this research paper that 80% of the food production in the world is done on small-scale farms. 80%. Let me just repeat that. 80% of the food production in the world is done on small-scale farms. So what is the answer to feeding the 8 billion people that occupy the earth? What is the future? Is it going to be commercial agriculture? Is it going to be industrialized agriculture? Or is it going to be leading the way for small scale producers to produce for themselves? And when we take a look at that, and we start to look at what's needed 
in order for people to produce their own food, we have to look at education. And that is the major gap that's missing right now in being in people being able to feed themselves. We're so used to going into a grocery store, some place where we could buy food and paying the least amount of money for it and not knowing how or where it's produced. But I would challenge ourselves that it's of utmost important to know how our food is produced and to trust the farmers who are producing it for us. I am not a proponent of organic agriculture. Do I follow it? For the most part I do. But I don't, I'm not a proponent for it, but instead I follow principles called in good agricultural practices. And that's irrespective of organic. It does include organic agriculture for the most part. But it also, it also is reflected into other philosophies. And those philosophies are social justice philosophies. They are environmental philosophies. And producing a good quality product for the people who are going to consume it. When I talk with farmers all over the world, and oftentimes it's in the former Soviet Union, the first thing I tell them for the shock value is I say I'm a capitalist. And for some of them, that's shocking to them. For others, it opens their ears. And the second thing I say to them is this, why are you chasing after the smallest possible income you can from a farm? Why aren't you chasing after the highest possible income you can get from a farm? That is a form of capitalism. In other words, what I'm saying is, the usual way we think about farming is, we have to compete with what's available in the market. We have to produce something that we can sell against something else. Once we do that, we begin to pit ourselves against industrial agriculture. If we shift out of that into a different paradigm, if we begin thinking of our farms differently, and we begin to thinking, how, how, how can I produce something on my farm that no one else has? Or how can I produce something that I can turn it into, like the blue ternatilla, turn it into something that's valuable, that something are willing people are willing to pay for it. Wouldn't that be social justice? Wouldn't that be, as I tell some of my farmers, your job as a capitalist and as a farmer, as a businessman or a business person, is to legally reach in the pockets of people who have money and getting them to pay for something that's different. So I challenge all of the people, all of the farmers that I work with to begin thinking outside the box, not inside the box. Don't think about industrial agriculture. Think about what you could do to offer something different to people so that they're willing to pay more money for something that they don't have. And that's the challenge we face. I'm going to wrap it up here. I know that, uh, but just by saying something that, you know, looking at Gigi right here. Gigi's background is not in agriculture. My background is. Gigi's background, first of all, is a business person, but secondly, was in the fashion industry. And one of the ways that she could relate to agriculture is by relating back to the fashion industry. And she could talk about that in depth, but just the whole idea of forecasting trends in agriculture. It's much like for fashion forecasting. Looking at the future, what are people going to buy? What are they willing to pay for? What products can I produce or make on my farm that can, I can ask more money for and put it into my pocket? Because once it goes in my pocket, it will enter into my community. Once it enters into my community, then that dollar or that peso is spent over um, over or a multiplier effect in that community, producing tax revenues for that community, producing wages for people who work in that community, but supporting that community. 
And one of the ways that we have of doing that is by interrupting the flow of imports into the Philippines and producing our own food and pulling that money out and using it within our communities to sustain development and to sustain the economic uh, fortitude of our farms. So with that, again, I'd like to say to my family, thank you very much. They've done far more than I ever expected our farm to do, and I invite each and every one of you to come visit Mocha Farm in Padre Garcia. Thank you.